there we go. That was perfect. That was okay. Three close. I have called to order the November 14, 2018 meeting of the Neshoba Regional School Committee. Um, our first order of business will, is to see if there are any citizens' comments. Seeing none, I'll move on. Uh, school Committee Vice Chair updates. Um, the only thing that I want to say is that um, Steve and Elise and Elaine and Lorraine and Lynn and myself, along with Brooke and Todd, attended the MASC, uh, MASS um, conference last week. Um, it was held in Hyannis um, from Wednesday through Saturday, and MASS is the superintendent, school superintendent's professional organization and MASC is the state's professional organization for school committees. And it is an opportunity to network with folks from other districts, but also to attend um, some workshops and panels. And um, we, I what I would like to do is for our next agenda uh, to give folks an opportunity, if there's anything they want to share about um, the the, con the the workshops they attended uh, to let me know and in and in, in just prepare uh, something brief. Steve was just sharing um, something about a, a conference he went to on Friday afternoon. So um, if we could add that to the agenda um, under the uh, maybe I don't know the second thing or under the updates, um, and I'll send out an email to remind folks if they want to uh, say something. And you two guys too, if you oh. want to add anything, <laughs> Thank feel free. You. Um, okay, so now I'll turn to Brooke. Sure, great, thank you. So that was my first item too, was just a, a, just to say thank you to the number of school committee members who attended. Um, we had a great representation down there, um, and there were there were people there literally like every day of the entire conference. Um, Chairman Ramosco also presented uh, one morning, and uh, I, I, just to speak about that one particular session, and I know several of us sat in on that, that particular session, and it was one of those moments in time when you kind of thought to yourself, as you were, were listening to the questions being asked of her, and you thought to yourself, I am so glad that I am sitting in a show with the show school committee right now, because it was really interesting to hear some of the questions, and I just thought she did a terrific job. Um, I, I, I thought it was a great conference. I really, I loved the conference. I thought it was particularly, uh, particularly good this year, and it was nice to have uh, our, our assistant superintendent there as well, Todd McGuire. And I, I want people to know too that those are conferences that start early in the morning and they go right through until late at night. And so it's not like there's a lot of breaks in between. It, those are pretty intensive uh, sessions. Um, and it was nice to have the commissioner, our, our new commissioner, there on the Wednesday night. So it was just great all around. But thank you to everybody who attended because I know that you have to take time out of your personal lives to do that, and that's a big deal. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, the website, um, I, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Assistant Superintendent McGuire here in a minute. But uh, just to give you a little bit of a brief on it, uh, to let you know that the work continues on in this area of the website, and I know that he's going to give you some uh, some greater detail than I can. But our schools have each sent some of the various uh, uh, various representatives, and they've been working diligently at cleaning up the current website so that it's all set to, in essence, dump over into the new template. So they've been diligently working at that, um, the, the, and I'm sure he'll tell you this too, the new website will roll up probably around six weeks after everything is all cleaned up and ready to go. So I don't know if you've got anything that you'd like to add to that. Sure, so the website update continues. Um, as of the start of this week, in terms of the cleanup, um, the current, uh, the existing website still exists, but since July 1st, we've actually deleted and cleaned up 1,100 pages that were on our district and school websites and web pages, just in terms of information that was older, information that no longer needs to be on there that isn't as relevant anymore. So we've been involved with members at each school. Um, our coordinator of digital learning, Cindy Larson, held a website cleanup meeting, uh, a day-long session where representatives from each of the buildings came over to really go through and streamline things. Um, we then held a parent focus group where principals uh, identified parents from each of the schools to meet with us 
so that we could do a focus group and get their feedback on in terms of what they're looking for and information that's important and essential. We also had surveys that had gone out to the staff last year as well as the community. Um, and so we're really in a good place right now to begin that changeover. Um, we sought feedback from the community, from administrators on templates, um, and really taking a look at you know what we want to uh, represent in terms of the website, and for it to be bigger and brighter, and for the information to really be streamlined. So we're working on that. Um, it's still a work in progress. We've got one more step to go through, um, and then we're going to turn it over to School Messenger, the company that we work with, to actually make the transfer to the new. Um, the new district and school web pages, and like Superintendent Clenchy indicated, um, that should happen within about six weeks from the start time of that. So we're hoping for a first of the year kind of rollout of the new website, new web pages, um, new images, new pictures, um, and it's been um, a good process thus far. Yeah, very good. We want to thank everybody who's had some level of involvement yeah. in it, the parents that came into to speak to us and, and the staff input. So it's all been very, very good, very positive. Um, next item on my uh, my agenda tonight, vaping session. Uh, you know that we were going to host a three vaping sessions, information sessions for parents. The first one is tonight. It's actually on right now. Um, and, and that particular one is happening in Bolton. Tomorrow night is at Center School, again from six to seven o'clock. And then uh, Mary Rowlandson will be hosting in Lancaster next Monday evening, same time slot, 6 to 7 o'clock. Uh, so we want to thank our nurse leader, Lisa Goldbicki, again for all of her work in this and for orchestrating running these evenings and bringing in the guest speaker. And then we'll do the same thing again for our school committee as a refresher probably in January. Um, on the news today, it mentioned that Juul is uh, pulling some of its flavorful yeah. cartridges and um, are not going to make them as readily available yes. as so. You're exactly right. Yeah. They and saw, They saw the handwriting on the wall. I think, I think that that's what sure. we said too earlier today. I think they're absolutely right. So, um, And they've pulled down, I believe, their Facebook page as yeah, well. So. That's right, their social media. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, snow days, um, uh, of course, <laughs> could come as early as this week. <laughs> I, 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 Rob, <laughs> Rob saying yes, <laughs> shaking the head. I can't believe we're doing this again, but he and I will be connecting probably at 3 o'clock at 3.30 in the morning. It's Friday, upcoming Friday morning. We'll see what happens. Um, but just a, a game, just to let everybody know, it's it's kind of nice because it's the same pattern now. So we what we know is that, um, you know, we'll, uh, our notification to parents is exactly the same as it always has been through school messenger, through Twitter, um, and of course the TV stations. The decision making process we're doing this, whether it's an early close, whether it's a late start, whether it's a complete close, all of that is not made quickly and it's made in consultation with a lot of people. A large number of other superintendents in the areas, our local DPWs, sometimes our, our police are involved. It just really depends on what we're up against. Um, so I want you to know that we work really, really hard to make sure that we make an informed decision. The Emerson Youth Risk Survey is um, coming uh, uh, coming out publicly probably within the next week to two weeks, so we're letting you know ahead of time. Um, you'll recall that this came out, I believe, two years ago, and um, uh, Donna Lindstrom at that point in time came in and did a presentation for the school committee. So Lisa Goldbicki will come in and do a presentation for us on, on that um, as well, <coughs> probably in, in the month of December. Uh, but know that it's going out and that um, school councils, of course, will also have presentations made to them too. The final item for me is the lockdown drills, and this is just really a, a keeping in pace with what we're doing with Alice and our um, training on this and our involvement with this program. Um, the, the schools have all started, uh, with the exception of the high school, is the only one that hasn't had a, a total um, full out drill, but all of our other schools and the communities have done this now. It's all been very age appropriate, so what we might do at the middle school looks very different than what we do at the elementary school, which all looks different than what we'll be doing at the high school. High schools receive some different training um, that, for example, our elementary schools kids would never have access to, you know. So uh, that's gone very, very well. We, again, we want to thank our, our safety partners. Our, our police are just amazing. Uh, Lancaster, we actually had our state uh, state police involved as well as our local police when we did that um, drill last week. So hats off to everybody. Everyone's doing a great job with them. And so that, that wraps it up for me. Thank you. Any questions for Brooke? Okay. Nope.
Thank awesome. You Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to invite Pat Maroney to join us for the business and operations report. before you um, the fiscal year 19 results of operations as of 9-30-2018. Um, as you can see, this is very early in the year, so there isn't a lot of movement um, as far as budget versus actual. So if anybody has any questions about <coughs> anything, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay. Um, so I was looking through previous versions of the results of operations and I wrote in my notes that this looks like the same one as September 30th, 2018. And it is the same one as September 30th, 2018. So did, are, are we just bringing that up to indicate that there has been no change? There really, at this point in the year, there really isn't a lot of movement. We, we have a couple of things that are known in our budget, but at this point, the um, it's, it's at the beginning stage of the spending at the schools. And as we get closer to the mid-year, you'll see that there'll be a little bit more activity and I'll be able to give you a little bit more detail. Okay. okay. Right now it's just too early. Right. Okay. Good eyes. It took me a minute. I was like, wait a minute, these are the exact same thing? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a good thing though, Mike. I want to, I want to point that out. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I'm up next to far. Um, mm -hmm. Insurance advisory update and for the capital plan update. Capital plan, I think, is next. The insurance <coughs> advisory committee um, met on October 24th, 2018. Um, at that meeting, um, as written in the um, Unit A contract, it's a committee made up of Unit A and Unit C members and um, some in administration and a retiree. And on that advisory committee, we have, um, we're discussing um, an RFP that we're going to put out um, in early January for our health insurance costs. Um, we're waiting for some experience uh, data from Maya, who is our carrier of our Blue Cross insurance. And as soon as we have that, we will start to compile the RFP. We have um, Brian Boyle from um, Bolton. He's an um, insurance consultant. He is helping us compile all of that information so that we have a really good RFP with many options to choose from. And um, we'll, as soon as we have the information all put together, we'll schedule another meeting with this committee so that we can move forward. Excuse me, Pat. What's experience data? Experience data is, um, it's basically how your group is doing. If you have a lot of um, claims for a lot of, you know, critically ill people, um, your rating would drop. So um, we actually, as a district, have a favorable rating as far as uh, Maya is concerned anyway, so um, we're doing pretty well in our rates <coughs> as compared to some other districts that may have a lot of, you know, really terminally ill people or something. That's a great question. So in the RFP, what exactly, <coughs> what exactly are you, um, is the RFP for? Is it, it's for new rates. Um, Just rates. Right. Not other insurance companies? Yes, other, yeah, insurance, other insurance companies. companies. This is for yeah. multiple insurance companies. So we're reaching out to Fallon, um, Harvard Community Health, um, directly to Blue Cross and to Maya. Because Maya is a broker of Blue Cross. They What they do is they bring communities together and they purchase insurance as a group where you can go directly through Blue Cross as well so this is what we're proposing we're going to send these rfps directly out to these carriers and then um so that everything is like mm -hmm. so we have a good comparison they will quote us rates and then we'll be able to make a decision sometime in january so this is a this is by invitation this isn't a cast out there who wants to respond it's it's just going to these four 
Well, it was recommended that these are the four that we re reach out to at this point because this is what's relevant for our population. By who? By Brian. Okay. So Maya um, represents more uh, um, insurance companies than uh, Fallon, Harvard, and Blue Cross. <coughs> Do they come under the Maya umbrella? No, they just Blue they Cross. They just does? Blue Cross. And what are their insurance companies? Are they, <coughs> do they represent? Maya only has Blue Cross. Only. So what's the difference between reaching out to Blue Cross and reaching out to Maya? Because um, if you reach out directly, say we have 400 um, employees in the district, mm -hmm. then we would, we would uh, be viewed as just 400, where with Maya, they're looking at Thousands. Thousands. Another district. Right. Okay. It's more of a collaborative with other, right. other school collaborative. districts. It's That's the difference, as opposed right. to going directly to Blue Cross. Okay. And what do we have right now? We have Blue Cross. Cross. Okay. D um, through Blue Maya Blue. or independent, just through directly? Through Blue Maya. Blue. Through Maya. Oh, through Maya. So yeah. we have Maya. Okay. So okay. Okay. does this mean that, um, I'm just trying to interpret this, I don't, I don't know how typical it is for these the, this committee to meet. Is this an annual thing? Is this a does it happen once every few years? Once every few years is typical. We wouldn't do an RFP every year unless we felt that it was necessary. So I don't think that that's your question, though, is well, it? Well, that was sort of leading into the question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, but that's not right at the, at the heart of the question. I guess my question is, does this mean that in terms of the what carriers um, the district uh, will offer in the rates, that changes the foot? Is that, is that what this means? That it could be changes. So changes that directly affect the employees then? Yes. Okay, so I don't know if it's too early to, to mm -hmm. ask this because the RFP hasn't been submitted. Mm -hmm. But um, how, do we have a, a timeline to notify employees of this change? And is, oh. this for the, is this for the 2019 or is this for 2020? This is for 2020. For 2020. This would be for 2020, September 1st, um, 20, 2019, but it would be for fiscal year 2020. Okay. Basically, um, we would compile all of the information and look at what's been presented to us, and the committee would review this, the, the insurance advisory committee, and we would decide whether or not we're going to make any changes to what we have or to choose a less expensive option for the employees of the district. And it's important, Mike, to note too, that this is all runs through the contract. So this isn't something that's like a standalone type thing. This is all contractual. Right. Right. Okay. And and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is all kind of generated because of the Cadillac tax is going to be invoked in 2020. That there's, there's some updates. Uh, there's some that. updates on the Cadillac tax. I, I don't think I want to start going down that road right now, but there's yep. some definite changes that we're, we have certainly been made aware of. Okay. Okay. Other questions for Pat? <coughs> I'm going to move on to the capital plans for 2020. Um, on the 19th of November, um, we'll be submitting capital plans to the town of Lancaster. <clears throat> That's the requested data submission. And on the 21st, we'll be submitting to the town of Bolton. Um, we, at this point, we don't have a, a, a definite date as for the um, submission of our capital requests for the town of Stowe, but we're expecting it soon. So do we have a list of capital yes. projects? Yes. Will that be presented to us before or after the town? After the, the dates are early, so so you're gonna you're gonna request the capital request to the town, and then depending on that conversation, come back to us. I mean, I'm just what the town. The towns are very early this year. Uh, a lan well, certainly Lancaster is particularly early this year. So it it kind of caught us off guard. Actually, Lancaster mm -hmm. caught us off guard this year. Did they say so. why? No, I think it's just the process that they're using. Again, remember there was some administrative turnover there between last year and this year. Yeah. So, and so we're requesting these things from the Downs, and they will let us know yes or no. That's and if it's no, what do we do? <laughs> well, we move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, we have some updates on the capital too, mm -hmm. unless anybody has any further questions on capital requests. Any other questions? We just, we, um, oh, all of the, we discussed all of this in the um, budget mm -hmm. and warrant meeting. Oh, okay, good. Today, so. Thank you. For um, twenty, uh, for this in this fiscal year, we've hired an engineering firm to assess our buildings. Um, the company is called Hogan Associates. Um, they are building and environmental assessment. It's a building and environmental <coughs> assessment company, and basically, what they do is they go into each of the buildings. They look at the age of the boilers, the water heaters, everything, look at the roofs, look at the condition of the windows, and they um, produce a document that we can use for our capital planning in the future. Um, is this a dog? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> just to just remind you to be recognized. Sorry to have to be that. But I like this one, though. <laughs> no, I know you do. Just raise your hand and I'll call on you. <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. So we're hoping that this will provide us with a, a, a document that we can use for all of our capital planning in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, they are actually in the buildings this week. Um, Rob Frieswick has been um, accompanying them so that they can do their assessments. I knew you'd love that. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that there's a difference here too, uh, you know, we've been <coughs> telling you that we've been working away at, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been struggling with it because we need we need a different set of eyes than just our set of eyes that like uh, and I think back to Lancaster schools is a perfect example where we've known for the last basically three years and I knew coming in that those doors were rotting, you know, and so there's things that you that we can see but then there's other things that we can't see. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and we said, you know what, we need to bring a team in here to take a, an official professional look at this. Mm -hmm. Beyond what we know, like the doors are rotting or whatever. So that's why we've taken the approach that we've taken. Yep. And we thought, you've asked for this for years now, and so this is exactly what you've been asking for. It, it is, but I'm just wondering, I'm glad you hired an outside firm, because it'll get done. But I'm wondering, how are they presenting the information? Are they giving it to you in a program form where you can actually use it? Or, I mean, what is the uh, integration so that you can use it? Because if they just hand it over to you, you're not going to be able to it, it'll take time to find information. What's the plan for, for um, analyzing and acting on the information? Well, I think it's almost too early for, for that, but I think... No, it, it's not. I will, they, uh, just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> so Rob, Rob's going to talk. Right, Rob's going to tell us. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know if I have all the answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in the assessment, be, you know, like Pat said, they're going to come in, they're going to look at all the vital components of buildings starting from the roofs and working down into the basements and everything in between. They're going to come up with life expectancy of each of the components, um, what's left of the life expectancy, um, and from there we'll take it and call in contractors to provide pricing, you know, and then prioritize things. If, you know, something is a year out, two years out, three years out, we'll be able to put that, you know, forward in the capital plan um, based on the priorities of what the life expectancy of that particular unit is in. So. So they're going to give us all that information, and then we'll go from there and get pricing and prioritize it in the capital. So, yeah. and so we would be able to do like a look ahead, like yeah. plan it out maybe over the course of several years. Yeah, that, yeah the five, exactly ten right. year, I'm fifteen sorry. year. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So my fear is that the the way you receive the information mm -hmm. might be as daunting as not having the information because there's no way to look it up. So is there a I mean, how are they going to give you this information? Because you've got seven buildings? Mm -hmm. Or eight? But you've got the by building, it's going to be broken down by building. By so building. it'll be Mary Robinson, Luther Burbank, High School, Sawyer, Emerson, But Central even within Office. that, the parts and pieces, if they're, if they're doing what I think they're going to be doing, it's huge. It's, so, yeah, there's a lot of components. So is it just going to be a spreadsheet? Or are they actually, is, it, is there a program that they're giving you? Is there No, there's actually program? on their website. I can, I can get the information for you. Um, they give sample reports on their website. So I can give that to you. You can mm -hmm. see exactly. It'll be broken down. Well, I just want to make sure it's user friendly for you. Because then, yeah, it's, oh, absolutely. then it's just not, it's not helpful. Yeah. Sure. It was one of the things that we looked at first. Okay. Yeah. And then it'll flag when things are coming up? Yeah, it'll, it'll show, you know, the life on, we'll, I can talk to Joe about it and, you know, 
prioritize it based on the life expectancy. If there's something that's in zero, two years out, we'll try to prioritize it and flag it, and then we'll know that we need to move on. But will it quickly. flag automatically? <coughs> yeah, are you, are you, right, excuse me, Lynn, we're getting into the weeds. Uh, Rob's going, but thank you, very thoughtful. You have this level of expertise <laughs> no, I just that we don't have. Text. But no, no, no. But um, Rob said he'll send you uh, a link to some of the samples, and then as we proceed, we'll see how it's going to work. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mike. So, two questions. Um, the environmental assessment, does that mean within each building, air quality, water quality, that kind no, of thing? No, it won't be that. Th that's a component of what they do. Ours is going to be building. Um, Mechanical systems, things of that nature. It won't be. It won't be the the environmental part of it. Okay. And how often? I don't know if you're the person asked, but how often does that happen? That we sort of evaluate. You'd, you'd be amazed at how much of that we've done in the last two years, quite okay. frankly, right across the yeah. district. I, I don't, I'm not sure if we're on a cycle, but I know that we've done a lot of it within the district. In fact, last year, uh, you have to correct me on this, but. We, we did water samples. We entered into a, like a, a sampling system for water that we didn't have to at all, but we chose to, and we did it right across this district. I want to say it was 145 samples or something like that. Yeah, through UMass um, had a program, voluntary program for lead and copper testing that we participated in. Most schools in the Commonwealth have participated in it. It's a free program. Um, you know, and it gives a look of the quality of water that we have, you know, for the lead and copper. We're fortunate enough, we didn't have a lot of issues. There's some schools out there that have to go through daily flushing of their systems to, to clear that water out to make sure it's safe for the kids to drink. And the other question was, and this is the first thing that popped up in my head, was there is, is there any connection or communication between the, the findings of the assessments and the, the state? How the state views sort of our submission into the renovate or rebuild? Is there sort of a <coughs> connection with what, what their findings are and what the state kind of gathers as data? Not really, because the state does its own thing along the, these lines. Uh, but every five years, we just came off that cycle, I think, last year or the year before. And so they do their own piece. And it's not nearly as specific as this, but we, we could take some of this to use it for an SOI right. moving forward. So I mean, we may find things, for example, that come out of this for the high school that if we don't que get queued up now, we can turn around and utilize that and use it as um, evidence moving forward. Okay. It's probably, you know, just one more thing on the environmental assessment. Uh, Department of Public Health um, will come out if you know if we see an issue or if somebody brings an issue to you know our attention they'll come off for free and, and do some of that work for us you know if need be um, what's another avenue we can go down so they're a great asset to have any other questions for pat or rob lynn the time frame what do they expect to be done so we're actually starting with those because of the snow and scheduling we were supposed to um we're starting tomorrow in Stowe, and we're going to do Stowe, and then on Monday we're going to move to Bolton, um, and then from there we're not quite sure because of Thanksgiving next week. Um, they're planning on coming in on Wednesday, so I'm just going to try to pick a smaller site so that way we can get you know get done fairly quickly, uh, so that way we can move on to the holiday weekend. Um, so potentially by Wednesday we'll have um, two to three sites done, um, and then that following week we'll hopefully finish them up. I'm um, talking with Joe Hogan. Um, he wants to, he doesn't want to do it all in one time, you know, do one every single day because there's going to be a lot of information. So he wants to collect all his information, go back, put it in some, you know, start the reports and then move on to another building. So that way there's no overlap and make sure that everything's very thorough. Uh, Lynn, has he done this before? Is this yes, something yeah, this is, yeah. That's, that's what they do. They, they, they do commercial schools. Uh, real you know, commercial real estate, um, shopping malls, things of that nature. Any other questions for Robert? Lynn, I'm okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate all the information and the updates. And I think they'll probably Next. most are you going to stay there to talk uh, Florence Sawyer. And I know that Don Lowe is uh, here as as well. So if we so we'll just leave them sitting there for the okay, next. Okay, that's time. that's fine. All right. So. So, um, as you know, last year we installed 
uh, we did the town of Bolton installed um, new propane boilers at the Florence Sawyer building at 100 McCann Street. Um, one of the components of, of the boiler system, um, and it's the, co the control system, is aging. And it wasn't in the replacement in the first phase. And uh, Rob can probably speak a little bit better about the technical end of this and let so you know exactly what's happening with this. The control system that is in place now uh, is probably original to the renovations of 97, 98, two, you know, 2000, somewhere in there. Um, the computer itself, I think, has been updated a couple times, she? Yeah. But right now, the system that's in place is not supported by Microsoft. And <coughs> IT has done everything they can to keep this system up and running, um, but it's failing at a, at a pretty rapid rate. Um, when they did the boiler project last year, um, it was through the green communities, um, so they had grant funding. Um, so it was at no cost to the town of Bolton. And what we had hoped to do is submit for grant funding this year to upgrade the whole component the whole uh, controls system um, front end computer um, that goes down to the boiler plant and then from there it goes to univents and handlers you know down to the classroom level um, right now we have very little control um, over the classrooms uh, for pulling in you know when the outside air temperature gets to a certain temp boilers kick on, start moving hot water through the system, talks to the classroom air, the temperature, the thermostats in the classroom, and then opens up the unit vents to um, basically regulate the air temperature that's inside the room. We have no control over that anymore. Uh, and our fear is that we're gonna lose control to the boiler plant itself. Um, and at that point, we're just gonna have to run it manually, which is gonna be at 100% output, um, which we're gonna burn through a lot of fuel it's not ideal. We could tax the system. We could have failures of the boiler, the pumps. There's a lot of things that could happen. Um, so what we're looking to do is make a sort of an emergency upgrade right now to the, the front end, the boiler part, the computer, uh, which will run some of the pumps, uh, a lot of the vitals that are inside the boiler room. And in, to do so, <coughs> um, we spoke with John Lowe about um, whether or not it, it, this would be a capital item typically that we would submit to the town in advance um, seeing as we're having these failures that we did not anticipate um, at the rate at this rate anyway um, we went to John and we talked to him uh, and he said that you know Bolton would like to move forward with this but in in doing so that was going to tax their reserve funds and I think too, with Don being here, uh, it might be uh, behoove us to have Don speak on <laughs> on Don's behalf and uh, fill us in on from your you perspective. Like do you, so, do you want to join us at the yes. table, Don? Yeah. Rather than Pat saying Don said, it would make sense <laughs> if Don just said. <laughs> <laughs> I was enjoying hearing what I said. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I would like to see us be supportive of the project. I mean, I, uh, do we know that there's going to be a failure over the winter? No, we don't. But as Pat said, now I get to say what you said. Okay. Um, as Pat said, um, this is deteriorating at a rate that we <coughs> haven't seen last year. So this is truly an unforeseen circumstance. We knew the system had to be dealt with, and we planned on replacing it as part of the next application for the grant to do the other half of the boilers and to take care of this. So this is something that's accelerated. And it is largely, I think, due to, uh, not totally, but largely due to the to the ancient uh, software system that we have in there. So that being said, um, an unanticipated expense is normally paid for under the advisory committee's reserve fund. Uh, the reserve fund is $100,000. Uh, the quote that we have to do this in a planful manner is $22,000. So before the first snowflake falls, $22,000 out of the reserve fund. But not really, because uh, tomorrow night our veterans agent is coming in um, to request a, a reserve transfer uh, because we've seen a spike in requests for veterans benefits, which is a good thing that we have veterans out there taking advantage of the benefits that they're entitled to. 
Um, we really can't deny veterans their benefits. We have to front all the money for them. And he's looking at, for, uh, he's asking for a transfer in excess of $20,000 tomorrow night for that. So we pretty much we get to the point where we're about $45,000 into a $100,000 reserve fund before winter. So uh, there are options for our advisory to deal with that. Now, of course, one option is to say, well, we're not going to support the capital request. I, I don't anticipate advisory saying that. But one idea that I came up with, and I don't know if advisory would like to see this or not, but trying to be as creative as possible, uh, would be for the school district to front the expense out of the E and D fund, and then the town reimburse you uh, the full amount in um, the first assessment payment in July. So we wouldn't have to hit the reserve fund right away, but the school would not, the district wouldn't bear any, any expense for this, it would just be fronting the money. Might make the cash flow issue that we're gonna be dealing with a little more palatable to the advisory, a little easier to manage, but uh, that's something that the school committee would, would, would have to approve to do. It's not something that, that the administration can do on their own. And as I said, I don't know that that's something that advisory will ask for, but I think it would be, it would be a nice option to have and maybe able to allow us to, to manage it a little easier that way. So um, if that, you'll know um, after tomorrow whether or not you want to make that proposal to us. Oh no, I'm making the proposal tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it, uh, this won't be on advisory's okay. uh, agenda tomorrow night. So if we um, uh, agree tonight that this is something we want to do, we have assurances that we will be reimbursed from the yes, town of right. Birth. Yes, well, I can't make assurances for advisory, but the understanding would be Advisory would say that they would, they would need to say that they would do 100% reimbursement in order okay. for this to be a viable option. But what I'm thinking is that we say okay, and they haven't said okay yet. So well, true, but I mean that's contingent I mean, upon contingent. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's it's strictly a contingent okay. vote. I mean, you, I would suggest your your vote would be contingent upon advisory agreeing to the condition. And if they don't agree to the condition, then it's not then it's not a deal. Questions for Don? No. I just have a clarification. Um, so the boiler replacement was through a grant? Yes, the Green Communities Grant. Which included the controls? No, did not include the controls. The second phase was to include the controls. So there's still a grant out there, or still a grant that you're going for? That's a going a to grant we're going for. Mm -hmm. We'll be applying, I think, in March. March. Um, and we were we received really good feedback from the state on how we managed the, the first part. There's no such thing as a guarantee in any grant, but I think our grant application, I, I think it was viewed as a two-phase project. Yeah. And I think our grant application is going to be viewed very favorably, but uh, we still need to go through the process to do that. So these controls are strictly for the boilers and not for any other part of the mechanical system? Boilers and it's going to be tied into the VF, the pumps and some of the VFDs that control the pumps. Right? So these are, but it's for the boiler plant itself. It doesn't branch out into anything else. So the only, the, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, when you change out all those controls to work with, I guess microstations, which you have, what about the rest of the system? Is it going to work? Is it going to be able to talk? No, no, it won't. We have no communication with it as right now. Right now, well, right now, but when you. Are you slowly phasing everything into the new system somehow, or is are you going to manual stuff and control stuff? I think perhaps, I'm sorry, but perhaps to answer the question, I think you're asking when we do the second phase of the upgrade. Yeah. Anything we do now would be upwards compatible with that. So this isn't twenty-two thousand dollars that we would just be spending on a temporary fix. This, this would all work with the upgraded system. But the upgraded system isn't just the boilers, I mean, you've got the VFDs and everything else being attached to it, which are on old controllers. So I'm just wondering, is the whole system going to talk? Has anybody looked at like, the system as a whole in the school? We've looked at it, yeah. We have, a, okay. we have a, a, ABS has come in, um, they've put a quote together for the entire system, and this front end part is part of that whole project. So we're basically taking one phase, doing it now, and then when the grant funding comes through, then we upgrade the entire system, and it all, it's all the same system. 
And that's happening, happening in March or later? Well, the grant funding goes through in March, and then we don't find out the findings until July. Okay, so after March, if that gets accepted, the whole system control-wise will be upgraded? Yes. If all, you know, all, every, every all the mechanical stuff in the one building? Everything. Okay. And all the work would be done prior to the, the next two weeks. Yeah, and, well, the reason I ask is I just, as it, it keeps coming up with Florence Sawyer and boilers, as it keeps coming up, people are going to ask that same thing. Can we just do that? So I'm just asking. So, Steve, we complete. I remember the discussion mm -hmm. on this a number of months ago that you, that we, you would, you, the first piece was, was put in, mm -hmm. and then you would be coming back ask, um, to deal with <coughs> the second piece, which was the control system, which you hoped and prayed there were thoughts and prayers that um, the system could kind of stumble its way through the, the bad weather but I, I guess the the hopes may still be there but the prayers didn't work and well, I, I and wasn't concerned enough to go into prayer mode at that point I was, okay. just, I was just hoping that but you know you know, you know what I mean and, yeah. and, but basically it's failing faster than you thought it would you That's thought right. you might have a little time but, but you don't. We thought we could make it through this winter, and the evidence now is that it's it's risky. And, ba and basically, what you're asking basically what you're asking us to do is to is to uh, uh, create a contingency, or not to create a contingency, but to force forward the money to you mm -hmm. to be repaid one way or the other. Whether you get the grant or whether you don't get the grant, can can right. We well, this is irrespective of the grant. This work this work would not be reimbursed by the grant. I mean, this is twenty-two thousand dollars. Right. This is not reimbursable. Okay, because but that would come from the town of. It would come from the town of Bolton. Okay. Uh, anything, anything over ten thousand right. dollars is a capital expense mm -hmm. that 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 we're responsible for. Um, it's it's a matter of well, from the advisory's perspective, it'll be a two-phase question. One is is the risk high enough, great enough to spend the money now to get the work done now. And then secondly, how is it to be paid for? You know, would we would we actually hit our reserve fund, uh, or would we uh, make an agreement with the school that you, that you front it and then we reimburse the school? So in in either in either case, if we front the money, we're going to get it back by the end of our fiscal year. I would say the beginning of the new fiscal okay, year. Okay, the beginning of the new fiscal year. Right. Six and one and a half. Yeah. I would I would recommend in the first. Assessment. We pay it quarterly, so in the July assessment, we would pay our normal assessment plus the plus whatever twenty-two thousand okay. dollars. I would like. I would like to move that. Wait. I just want to make sure the motion is specific. So my question is specifically, what is the the twenty-two thousand dollars for? Do you want to answer that, Rob? So I, that's what I get it right. It's for the front end computer system for the boiler room. Front end computer room. System for boiler system. Computer system for the boiler room. Yes. Okay. Florence so, Sawyer. did you know that? Florence Sawyer. You want to make a motion? Now? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Why don't you make a motion? Now? Yes. I'd like to move that the school committee um, advance the twenty-two thousand dollars from from the Indy e e e e e <coughs> to cover the cost of the computer system for the for the boiler room, right? Yes. Um, contingent. Contingent upon repayment in the first quarterly pay, re, first quarterly was assessment, uh, assessment um, in fiscal year 2020. Okay, and it's the Bolton Advisory, Advisory Committee. Committee that will be reimbursing us. Okay. All right, you want to do it again? Do you have a little bit Do you have a little bit have a little bit All right. Fix it. Uh, moves to advance $22,000 from the E&D fund for the front-end computer system for the boiler room at Florence Sawyer contingents on repayment from the town of Bolton via the advisory committee, the first assessment of the new calendar of the FY 20? 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Right. Would it, would it, I'm I'm sorry. Be, I'm sorry. We need a second no, and then we can ask questions. We have a motion. Somebody want a second? I'll second. Okay. All right, Mike. All right, Susan. Wouldn't it be contingent upon their approval of the repayment yes. and the wording. That's, so yeah, that's not, that's no, not that's Oh, all right, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm approval sorry, of the Bolton Advisory yeah. Committee. Yeah, the Bolton okay. Advisory Committee has to approve, approve it. Yep. Reimbursement. Approve the reimbursement. And then it comes out of the 
No. No. It comes out of the first. Yeah. It comes out of your E and D. It doesn't come out of it's it doesn't come out of E and D until it's contingent of coming out of E and D if they approve. If they approve. Right. All right. You want to read it again? If they have to approve. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that's deep. That's not going to be on their agenda tomorrow night, you said. No, it's not. Um, I was just I was going to say that um, I, I'd said to Pat that um, my recommendation in the process is that it, it, it's treated just as a, a capital request for the next fiscal year and that Pat and Rob would come in and uh, present this to advisory. I would be there to support it. Um, and we get on the agenda. I don't see us doing it before Thanksgiving, obviously. So I would say as early in December as possible. But in reality, we want to get the work done as soon as possible. Well, we do, but we can't. So that's so. But we need an advisory vote to do that. So I, I guess as soon as practical, get on the advisory agenda, uh, get a vote from advisory one way or the other, and then get the work scheduled as quickly as possible. But what you're saying, Rob, is that this boiler thing is. Not in good shape right now. That's Winter my is coming, yes. and we need it needs to be dealt with. So especially if something happens on a Friday night or a Saturday night, exactly. we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. You know if we, we have somebody know. in the building, you know, custodian of the building during the weekend, you know, we might find out. But we could have a potential coming in on Monday morning to no heat at all, which obviously is going to be an issue. Yeah. Especially yeah. Especially as yeah. the temperatures yeah. start dropping, we can you know, burst pipes. And then. How soon can somebody come in and actually do the work? About two weeks. Once we get approval, and we um, you know forward all the information off to them. It'll take about a week to get all the parts in. And then can't you get approved? Can't you do the same thing we're doing and, and get the RFP? Do you have to do an RFP for this, or can you just? No, it's it's proprietary. Okay, so couldn't you get it set up? and make it contingent upon their approval or contingent upon something because it's going to be two weeks anyways. So if they're lined up, as soon as they say yes, you're good. Well, you can't, uh, again, now I'm speaking for Pat again, but procurement's procurement. You can't enter, you can't enter into a contract with a vendor unless you've identified, that you, unless you've verified you've got payment mm -hmm. ability to pay. Okay. So I'm concerned that um, it's, it's like this needed to be done yesterday. And we have to, we, there is money in the MD to do it. Um, and if we make it contingent upon approval of both an advisory committee, then we're going to be waiting because the November meeting is tomorrow. It is. So we'll be waiting for the December meeting. There's not, there's not one scheduled yet. I think we could get one scheduled in a couple of weeks, but I'm to set appropriate expectations. I'm thinking. <coughs> So Today's the 14th. It's going to be the 20, either the 28th or the first week of sure. December. Susan? Well, I'm just thinking that, it, I mean, if, if it were to fail, right, and you said that you'd have to run it manually and then they'd be, be running it 100% Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, that would be the town of Bolton's. They, they would incur any of those, right, any of those costs. Like, it wouldn't be us. So it seems like it would behoove them to add a meeting in. Like it, well, like well, it maybe we're not going to incur the additional fuel costs. No, no fuel no, costs no, no. we would incur them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and the monitoring okay. of the boiler. Right. So we're talking with if, if if we if we wait uh, in a, for a contingency vote for that from them, we're talking a month away at best. Is there a workaround, Pat? Well, we could do the work, and then and then in anticipation and then just build the town mm -hmm. well if you have a well, I, still I mean, the process I think, you know i like to think we always work in good faith together <laughs> i think if yes. if there's a critical situation here and the and the district felt that it needed to be addressed right away again i don't speak for advisory but i would like to i would like to think that advisory would make you whole and with this twenty two thousand dollars as you were speaking about before be part of the capital improvement plan for FY20. I thought you said that it would. That's what it would go on the books as. No. No, no. I'm saying the presentation would be the same as I if see. we were doing a capital okay. a proposal for FY20. Right. Yeah, Mike. This might be echoing what you just said, Don, but I'm a little slow. Um, if, if if the the money is there for in the reserves, can't can't you just use that money and then change the motion to to re reimburse afterwards so that at least it's in motion now 
No, because I don't have the authority to allocate that money. Only the advisory committee does, and it requires a vote of the advisory committee. So either way, it's off until end of November, first week in December, whether whether this motion passes or not. Well, it depends on what the motion is, because I, what I heard Kathy and others say is that there's enough concern is why don't we just get the work scheduled now and get it done as quickly as possible with the hope that the town of Alton will reimburse the expense. Could we say in anticipation of reimbursement instead of hope? No. <laughs> you can say whatever you like. <laughs> um, in anticipation, that, short. That's probably a good uh, way of, uh, of dealing uh, with it. I, uh, quite frankly, I don't want to wait. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I don't want to wait. I, I don't want, like, we've got snow potentially coming Thursday, Friday, and if that, that system goes down, we have no way of knowing this weekend if that system goes down. And I'm really worried about the potential. Like, I mean, if that, that thing goes down and there's a lot of damage done, we could be out of school for a week, two weeks. I mean, for $22,000, I think we have good faith in our, our communities, we have good faith in Don, and we have good faith in the judgment that that advisory committee always makes. So I don't have any concerns right now. I think we need to get the work done and need to to make the motion in anticipation that we will be reimbursed by the town. I, I, I think the advisory committee always conducts <coughs> itself very responsibly. I'm oh, being, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just being very cautious to not sure. speak for them in any mm -hmm. way. No, absolutely. Lynn. Totally understand. I, I understand your urgency. But it's not going to be done this weekend. No, 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 I know that. All right, just so you know that. But I'm just saying, uh, we're not Does waiting four is, weeks oh, for snow. The snow is coming. Yeah. You know? no, that's fine. It's right, so. right on my desk right now. All that needs is a signature. I'm mean, going to go down there right now, sign it, and get the wheels in motion. Um, but you're talking two weeks. And then obviously, with so Thanksgiving next time. week. I would, yeah. I would, yes. I would, you want to amend the motion? I would, I would, well, I would change the motion and take out the contingent upon. So read the motion if we take out contingent upon. It was twenty-two thousand dollars just taking out the word contingent upon. Well, I think we we want to add an anticipation of reimbursement oh, from Bolton Advisory oh. Committee. Okay, so okay, so. Or with the understanding that. Do we want to understand or anticipate? Yeah. I really can't, well, can't say understand. Well, they well, haven't. With the, other, it. Uh, with the understanding that. Uh, this is this is reimbursable to the school committee from not unless they approve it. Right. So I would. In, uh, that's why I think anticipate is the of the approval. Do you want to read it? Yeah. Let's see what it's, we have. It's their response. Okay. Uh, move to advance twenty-two thousand dollars from the E and D fund for the front end computer system in the boiler room at the Florence Sawyer <coughs> Florence Sawyer School. In anticipation of the approval of the Bolton Advisory Committee for reimbursement of payment in the first assessment of the FY20. Okay. Yeah. All right, can Steve, you want to move that? Can I amend uh, something on that? Um, we need to probably you add can't a little bit of a contingency. I'll, I'll no, I mean, I just want to make a recommendation that we not to exceed 25000 as opposed to 22000 Oh, okay. Case, not to exceed them you know, as taxes or whatever else. Yeah, I well, think that's not, not to exceed 25000 yes. okay. I think that's pretty. All right. All right. Should I reread it again? One more time. Reread it. And okay. that's the motion. And then we need a second. Go ahead. Uh, Mike already seconded it. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. All right. So read it again and then. All right. Go ahead. Move to advance um, the amount, an amount not to exceed $25,000 from the E&D fund for the front end computer system for the boiler room at the Florence Sawyer School. Uh, in anticipation. In, yep. in anticipation of approval of the Bolton Finance, advi the Bolton Advisory Committee for repayment on the first assessment of the FY20 budget. Okay. Any questions or further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Don. Thank Thanks, Don. Thank Rob. Rob, thank you. Sign that. Sign that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right now, sign it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Whew. All right. I think that we are ready to talk about extended learning. And we I'd like to invite Raina Rago to come up and join us. Mm -hmm. We have um, the first extended learning presentation is first. <coughs> I'm not sure how this goes down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't pull it. Will you be advancing the slides? Uh, I can. Okay, I'll, I'll say yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
first one is that little fun video. Right? So I'm excited to present to you some of the happenings and progress that we've made this year. And in case you're wondering what my button says, it says Extending Learning Rocks. And yes, you will get a button at the end of the presentation, so you've got to listen. So this is a little video. Take a peek. And I don't think the volume is quite Sorry. Can we start it over? Yeah, you should be there. Okay, thank you. Okay. It's a quickie, 17 seconds or so. So this was a little um, video clip from the spectacular program that we just recently did over the Halloween festival time. The kids went crazy for it. It was sponsored by Mad Science that we brought in. And I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the magic that happens in extended learning. You know, curiosity, um, engagement. You can see in the background there some of the parents. Uh, a lot of parents did come and um, I got to tell you, some of them didn't want to leave. It was, it was that good. Um, because I'm fairly new in my role, three and a half months, um, if you could advance, thank you. I wanted to kind of review the renewed vision and commitment that I've made um, to the program, and um, thank you. And to promote an extended learning program that offers students creative choices, and I want to emphasize creative choices, consisting of diverse opportunities, both academic and social growth. I say both because we're really talking about the whole child. It's not like they're coming there to just do homework. They're coming there to learn how to collaborate, problem solve how to interact with different you know, students okay. in different classes that they may not have met otherwise. In terms of commitment, um, very important to strengthen the communication with families, which we've been doing, I've been doing through updates and newsletters and surveys. I heard loud and clear about partnering with our principals, and they are key because we bring a lot of our programs to those buildings. Um, so we need to be able to know what's going on. And I've been working with them and meeting with them, and it's been very helpful. Building more community connections, that's big on my list because I really feel as though what we can do with our students in the after school program is to build community connections and citizenship. So working with nonprofits, Council of Aging, um, Rotary Club we're working with in Neshoba, and it's, it's wonderful. Expanding opportunities for our middle school students. Um, I recently put together a survey about six weeks ago to our parents of middle school students and they came back loud and clear saying they want STEM programs for their children after school. And yes, they are going to get it. So I'm excited about that. We continue to have applicants from high school. I think it's wonderful that we have high school students who are helping out, six right now, um, especially those students who are interested in, in pursuing an educational career or one in psychology. Um, and they're the ones who know how to get on the floor and get dirty and do hula hoops and all that. I'm also very interested in bringing more cultural events to the Neshoba District. Um, to really expand our children's knowledge of the world. And we recently had an uh, event called Sohori Weaving, it's the Japanese weaving, you'll see a picture coming up, where our students got to actually experience working on a loom, a Japanese loom. There are a lot of uh, enrichment programs and clubs, I'm not gonna read them all, but I do wanna emphasize that we have um, a lot of variety. They're multi-week programs that we offer that are fee-based. They're very reasonably priced. We want to make it available to as many students as we can. Um, this fall, winter, we've offered chess wizards, archery, theater. We brought in soccer as a new program. We've continued with our music programs. And new this year, I brought in a yoga program for our middle school students. And yes, there are boys who go. There are 10 girls and two boys, and they're loving it. And probably the most exciting program of all so far has been the Imagerina program. It's a um, basically a maker space. The kids get to play it. We do problem solving in small <coughs> groups. And if I, I'm trying to think about how would I get that little um, Alita, the, uh, we could get the visual on the left hand side to play with the kids at the table. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Just a snippet to show you what happens with these children when they're working collaboratively with other kids. They want to problem solve, collaborate. 
lots of different clubs. I won't review all the lists, but I will say that um, one club that I'm particularly excited about is the Blanket Club. The students at Hale are making blankets for a shelter. So I'm really trying to incorporate other things besides, not that there's anything wrong with a Scrabble Club, but to do more connections with the outside world. Special events are those enrichment events that are free to all of our extended learning students. We brought in a few this year, Spectacular, I showed you the link earlier. So hurry weaving, you'll see the little boy actually using a loom. And yesterday, I'm telling you, kids as young as kindergarten were making fiber art. And I got three, you know, four emails say from parents saying, my, my child wants one for Christmas, a loom. <laughs> Mad Science was a big hit. We'll bring another program in called Holidays. And you may, on the bottom, you see um, Chef Tom, who's working with children um, to help them learn about good eating habits, nutrition, and that's, that's a problem we bring to Hale. As I said, community partnerships are really big on my list because I really feel that it's something that will build our students beyond the academics. You know, they're learning how to be compassionate and caring and give back. So we're working with the Rotary Club of Neshoba. They're coming this Friday to do a bike safety program here in Bolton. Uh, we've, we've planned some senior center visits. We work with local farms and orchards, the fire station, library visits. And these are things that a lot of our parents <coughs> will just um, see that. We want to know who can we connect with. I mean, our world is very big, but sometimes we get small, so we've got to expand that. Vacation camps, yay! Our first one is coming up in February. Um, it is right around the bend. I've been planning it for quite a while. I do have some. Uh, brochures I'll hand out if you would like it. We'll wait for that. They're right here. You can take one on your way out. Um, I listen loud and clear to the surveys from the parents. They want kids who are in middle school to be able to access the, the vacation camp. So we brought that in. We have two programs that will be suitable for them. The one that I'm showing you up here is Power Up, Sports Conditioning and Healthy Eating. This, the vacation camp is open to all students, not just our extended learning. They're half day, full day. I've done a projected um, revenue piece that will allow us, if we, we, we cannot run it unless we have a minimum of 48 kids. And we can run it up to 96 in terms of space and the number of um, instructors we can hire. And yes, numbers. I know everyone's into numbers, so I'm gonna do this. It's hard to see, at least for me, so I'm going to just highlight a few <coughs> of the more important numbers. Um, this year, we are anticipating approximately $754,800 in revenue based on our total estimated tuition. Our biggest site is Stowe Center. I'm there quite often and I'm amazed how 96 kids in the afternoon can be kept occupied and engaged. Our largest age group is kindergarten followed by second grade. And I gotta tell you, it's a very interesting world when you come up with programs for the little ones. It's just very different. Um, the enrollment is largest for the five days a week, both a.m. and p.m. Uh, last year, let's see, oh, I do wanna point out that our biggest tuition, of course, comes from our p.m. program, which represents about 684,000. And then our a.m. program, <coughs> an hour each day is uh, a little over 70,000. We are very competitively priced. I did a um, survey for the last couple of weeks looking at five different surrounding regional districts <coughs> and a couple private, well, I say Westboro being not regional, and we are one of the lowest. And I say that too because I think we're extremely strong in what we bring to the, I, not, I just feel like we bring a lot to the dance here. And the parents are, we add value. It's not just a daycare. It's not just a babysitting. It's enrichment. <coughs> and I can't say that that's true of all the programs I, I research. So I share that with you because um, I do think that probably there will be a conversation around that topic. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I have handouts for you on our program. So if you know people who want to make sure that they, they can't go to Disney World, we've got Fender Recreation <laughs> Band, and we have our holiday stage show and I really encourage you if you're around you know, to come and see it because you'll see something like I showed you at the beginning. You'll see kids having fun learning and they don't even know they're learning. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. I was told to be less than 10 minutes. Todd, how did I do this? <laughs> you did well. Good job. Perfect. Thank you. Raina. Questions for Raina? I have um, about the uh, vacation camps. 
What time? What's the time frame that they run? Are they all day? Or are they just the morning? There's six different programs I've planned, mm -hmm. and there's two that run all day, but there are two half programs that the parent can opt to have their child go to all of it, mm -hmm. in which case they get a slight discount. So I've got some AM only programs for three hours, some PM only programs, and then two programs that if a, if a parent desires to have their child, they can have them all day. And um, what's the, the typical tuition for the vacation camp? Yeah, it varies. Um, I will tell you that they're also competitively priced mm -hmm. um, because we're really not doing this as a profit. We're doing this to break even. Sure. Um, the, the most expensive program is my engineering program um, that we're working with um, the Museum of Science. And I found a fabulous teacher um, from Cornell University. And that's the Here Comes the Sun program, environmental engineering. And that's um, $150. So the programs range from 100 to 150 And then if you have your child in the whole day, it's 275 And that's for four <coughs> days. So it's very competitively priced. Um, and I know we're going to fill up, so you better sign up. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Susan. I have a question about the fee-based programming. Yes. Is that, um, if it, there's a student there who's um, paying tuition, they're just a regular extended, not regular, but they're an extended day learner, um, do they then have to pay the additional fee, or is it something they can opt into? For our multi-service, for our multi-week programs, the ones I showed earlier, like the uh, chess. the yoga or whatever. Yes, you yes they do. They um, and because we have to pay the instructors. They're, they're coming in special, like soccer, they bring in all the equipment. And we try to keep those pretty, you know, they're pretty, I would call them on the fair side. Like, for example, Mandarina was $65 for six weeks. So that's a very reasonable rate for what the kids get. Um, chess, you know, was a little bit more, was more $100, but it was 10 weeks. So all those extra programs are in addition to the tuition that the kids are earning? Correct. Okay. Uh, and then we bring in, we have a, a line <laughs> item for enrichment, which is when I bring in a program like Spooktacular or the Silver Weaving, which is free to all the mm -hmm. students. Thank you. Is there a sliding scale um, for people who might need some we help do, with tuition? We do have, we don't have a sliding scale such, but we will offer a financial assistance. Okay. <coughs> and uh, we have a, four children right now that are receiving that through the uh, financial reports that we require. <coughs> Questions? Lynn. Um, what are the hours for the AM and the PM? Yeah, AM is 7.25 to 8.25, so it's just an just hour. An hour. And then the PM is 3 to 6 PM. Other questions? Thank you. This was an incredible report. And the programming that you've brought in is, I want to go. I want to go. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to yoga. Um, but, no, yeah, but the way you presented it is, you know, it just hits the high notes and it's concise. You. And um, I feel that we're fortunate to have Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I, I really need it. Please come to, you know, drop in at the programs, you know? I sent a talk. I said, look what you're missing, man. And he's off, off doing your presentations. No, oh, come over. <laughs> I could use some yoga. <laughs> I'm just going to leave this here and take it as you wish. Thank you. Um, and so I think that we're going to we're going to go to the next item, which is going to be moving right along talking about the fees. Increases. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, so um, keeping in. Um, tune with basically um, rate increases as we have for other tuition. Um, we have um, some proposed extended day rate increases uh, on each of the programs. You can see from, um, Elise bringing up the paper right now, um, for the five day for one day on the morning and the afternoon program. I've proposed um, annual increases of 2%, 2.5, and 3.0%. Um, I brought this to the Budget and Warrant Subcommittee this evening, and we discussed it. And, um, <coughs> and, and so I think we can let them take it from here. But yeah, so basically we offered the three options to do the 2%, 2.5, or 3. Now we've already been through this before um, last meeting. 2%, you'll keep in mind that that, that was just the basic um, uh, increase for teachers. So, uh, but that doesn't represent all of our increases. That's just that basic. So that's why we decided, just as we did last last meeting, to go 2, 2.5, and 3, and then leave it up to you. So to Pat's point, we did present this earlier to our um, B&W committee. Um, and I know that Elise isn't here, so Steve, we'll turn this over to you. Yeah, we, we, we looked at it, and we <coughs> would recommend to the full committee 
uh, an increase of three percent. Because it's like 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 you said, it's two percent is the t is the, the faculty, the teachers, the salaries, and everything else costs more money. Oh, Susan, I just have a couple questions about, um, and it could be a total oversight on my part, but. Um, if, if there's anywhere, if there's a breakdown of the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, like how if it's a zero, if it's level funded, where do those what like what percentage of that expenditure goes to faculty and what percentage is for materials and so the, the, I'll I'll speak for Arena uh, and I think well first of all I mean we would we would let you know that this program is sustaining itself it right is. now so I think that that's You're probably our goal. Your rationale of increasing three percent is for faculty to keep so up I, with the regular cost. Of but how much of that seven fifty goes towards a I would say the bulk, the if, like if you figure that gen generally eighty percent of our budget exactly right. is that's, faculty. That's right. So figure eighty percent, you know, just but extended. You you have high school students. I, I don't understand that. It's not like eighty percent of the okay. extended learning goes to. So our faculty right now we have thirty two individuals. Of that, six are our high school students, and they are very sparse. I mean, they work. Two hour, three hours, three hours, okay. right? just to give them the experience. And those, when you when you use the term faculty, I say, do you, do you mean people who are under contract with the Neshoba Regional School District, or are these teachers that are hired to no. work? So about ninety percent of our staff are working in another capacity within the within district, the district service somewhere, or instructional so. assistant. Um, so they're not under the Unit A contract. Well, it doesn't matter. Unit A and Unit C are the same. Right. So oh, okay. They would, yeah. So well, it, wouldn't, no. it wouldn't make any difference. Extended day is under the United yes. contract. Okay, gotcha. And then okay. I've had and that, that was the two percent. Right. That, that's that's right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Your question is spot on. I st yeah. Okay. Right. I, I, I still would said, love to. Yeah. See, yeah. I mean, I I don't feel comfortable making the decision without seeing a breakdown of what the. I mean, I trust obviously your eight like, percent number of it. And then Lynn. Okay. Right. Like, you sure? Yes. Um, so when I look at the, the annual, the current annual uh, rates, those are those seem very clean, clean numbers, right? Two forty, four eighty, seven mm -hmm. forty nine sixty, mm -hmm. and then when we give the the percent increase, those are a little bit, a little bit messier. So I'm thinking to myself, well, <coughs> when did we institute those rates? How long have they been in place? Because if those represent a previous increase of two, two and a half, or three percent, then those numbers should be as clean as they are. Does that, does that make sense what I'm, what I'm asking? Well, I think <coughs> what's, what the issue was that we haven't always had an increase. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and when we have, it hasn't always been like a clean 2%, 2.5 or 3%. So over the years, I mean, you're saying it's not a nice round number like the... It's, it's really just kind of a curiosity thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're answering my question. Okay. Um, so. How did so we haven't been increasing regularly no. the rates? No. So how so how have we gotten by without doing we, that? Then? Didn't we re we increased no. rates last year? Yeah. Wait wait wait! Excuse me! Excuse me! Excuse me. <laughs> okay. So the question on the table is how did we get where we are? Right. Okay, Pat. Because the revenue from this program was being used to fund the budget. As a, as a revenue source for a long period of time. There's some other history here that goes back to before the forensic audit and all of that. Right. And, that, and, and so, in, in all truthfulness, this is part and parcel of um, tidying up some things. So this is a relic of something that's... Right. It, it, okay. We're just Understood. trying to make, sh make sure that we are... And we're really doing what exactly what the school committee asked costs. us to do last year, which is to try to keep our... All, all of these things in, in a level set so we never find ourselves right. where we were before where you've gone 10 years without making a change right. so that's why this is coming up and and the school committee had asked us to bring all of these things forward in a timely fashion as it related to budget which is why you're seeing all of these groups come forward right now um, you know so that like it was a, a K and pre-K I think last meeting mm -hmm. and you'll see the the percentage and they and the other thing that was brought forward to us was don't just do like the cola or the the increase it, it's got to be more than just that which is why we've consistently laid out to 2.53 mm -hmm. 
So. Gotcha. Thank you. And, then, and if I may, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Raina. And I do want to say. <laughs> Um, that in looking at the different districts that even with a two and a half percent increase propose that is that we will still be lower than all the other districts except for Leominster and that was what I found so I thought wow you, you start to kind of scratch your head and say how, did we, how have we done this so I still think we would be competitively priced and, and continue to add value Lynn. so I did the math and it's basically twenty dollars a day, and they're they're increasing it by sixty cents, but by ways and mm -hmm. it just makes more sense to me. Do it like that. Any other questions? Um, this program, as you mentioned, is cost recovery, so it's not to make profit. And so, and I think this might be in line with what Susan was asking. Um, if the and I, let me see how, if I can frame this clearly. Um, if it's three percent, what are the anticipated revenues and then <coughs> the projected costs compared to the anticipated revenue? Because I'm uh, we were in a mess three years ago. We were subsidized. I mean, it was just a mess. Um, and now we're on the right track. But is do we know that raising it to three percent? will uh, generate the revenue to cover the expenses and would that not happen if we raised the rate by 2.5 percent and I don't know if that you can answer that right now <coughs> but that's my question and, and maybe I turn to the sole member of the uh, budget advisory committee and advisors that are here is what was the determinant what was the what were the factors that made you decide to recommend three percent the factors that made that led us to three percent is that two percent is there. We 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 know that the two percent is built in for salaries, okay, for staff. Yes. So if you, if you, and and food, lighting, heat, everything else is not going to be covered by the additional one percent. Yes. In reality, but it's a step in that direction. Right. But so oops. what you're what what you're really leading me to. Is to is three percent enough? No, I'm oh. saying is I, Susan. Yeah, might there be an opportunity you? to absorb some of the two percent increase through other, like through cuts in, in? I mean, I hate to use that. Everyone hates that cuts word, but like, is there any way to take to lower the cost of some of the programming to offset the two percent? Like, it, I, to me, two percent is not a guarantee. If you've got Program that that costs if there's that other twenty percent of the of the seven fifty. So if there if you're saying that the eighty, am I, are we supplementing the program? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Our parents, See, like I, our parents, supplementing the whole well, uh, districts. So it, so you're 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 suggesting that because the contract agreed to includes a two percent <coughs> increase. For the faculty, that parents automatically have to pay that two percent increase. Yeah. I'm suggesting that maybe there could be a way to recover some of that cost within the extended day budget, but I don't know what those numbers are. See, so I'm not saying the same thing as you. Okay. What I'm saying is that what do you if you raise the 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 fee by three percent, what do you anticipate revenues to be? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, and then, what are your anticipated costs? Will there be a difference? Is there, a, you know, um, a gain? Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, and I, I get it that this was a if criteria that that we used to say uh, two percent, and we made different decisions about um, <coughs> integrated preschool and a full day K, but and it's it's more looking at the numbers that way. Than just saying two percent because mm -hmm. we increase teachers and uh, salaries, mm -hmm. and um, by two percent, I guess I want to see it more substantiated, and I'd want to see what we gain at three percent. Where the 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 breaking point is between your anticipated costs 
and what your income would be. So what you're really asking for is that we go back and run some different numbers and bring them forward to you at, at like the next upcoming school committee meeting. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, that's well, that would my suggestion. Lynn? So initially, when we first cleaned this up, I thought that the whole thing was we wanted this whole program to be self-sustaining. That's what I'm saying. So are you asking, is is it self-sustaining, or are they making a profit? No. Or are you saying uh, are they deficient? I, I don't know. I know that last year it became cost recovery. Okay. What I want to know is, what's the difference in revenue between 2.5% and 3%? And what are your anticipated costs for next year? And then compare the numbers. Because if you don't have to go to 3%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because so if you do, if, if a cost recovery program does uh, generate or have, have um, excess at the end of the year, then it goes back into the program. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see what the numbers are. You know, it's, it's to okay. Steve's point, 2% probably isn't enough. But what would the difference in, in revenues uh, be between 2.5 and 3%, mm -hmm. and the anticipated costs are going to be the same. $4,000 is the difference in revenue. If you take the, the revenue that you got this year. I'd like to see the, 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 the we'll data take from the extended. Yeah, because we're going to, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we're not going to be able to gain a lot more students because of course if you enroll more students then you have <coughs> exactly so we're sort of in a static environment yeah. in that regard mm -hmm. um, the one way that we can generate an offset if you will is by offering programs like the multi-week programs yes that do offset mm -hmm. um, but I think to maybe Susan's point it's almost like there is a there's a, a perception that everything should be free in extended learning which is impossible because we have to pay out so I understand what you're saying and I will work towards that you know you know share some thoughts with Pat and see what that, that, that's my opinion yeah. if the committee is ready to make a, a, a motion and, and take the vote then make the motion I'm just looking for for more information but if the committee is ready to move on this then by all means uh, I, honestly I was ready to go to three percent but it makes sense to make sure that it's, I mean, we're only talking 60 cents a day, but I mean, it adds up. So if it's, if you can come back fairly quickly and tell us, okay, it's status quo, we're self sustaining, or we're making a profit, I kind of don't want you to make a profit. Well, <laughs> well I don't think that that's, 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 that's our goal. That's our goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's our goal. I just want you to be self sustaining. So right. yeah. to be honest, the only kind of profit we make is literally five to ten dollars above the fees that we charge for the multi you know, programs. Um, and that's really to cover the building costs. I mean, in my mind, I'm always thinking, you know, how are we going to make sure that we have heat and all that? Because we're not looking to, we want as many kids to participate. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're going to see, a, you're not going to see us making a lot of money. We're going to be, we're going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. That's definite. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to be making a lot of money. But just for due diligence, I think we should probably. Well, and I, I think that the, the, the history of this has not been a pretty one. No. And um, so, um, and I would just be interested in that. But again, it's my opinion. If, if you know um, somebody wants to make a motion um, to um, based on the uh, budget warrants uh, recommendation, that's that's for folks to do. So you have the two options: either we accept this as the motion's made, or you send this back to do more due diligence. Those are the options. Steve, do you want to move the three percent? I move three percent. I'll second. Uh, any more discussion? Questions? Okay. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. More due diligence. More due diligence. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Raina. Oh, no. Nice job. Thanks, Raina. <laughs> Okay. Now we have um, Su Chi and Todd McGuire with the technology update. Welcome. Okay. I think um, I think tonight um, that uh, Todd will do most of the most of the speaking, most yep. of the presenting, and we're gonna. How to use Suchi as our resource. So, um, thanks very much, uh, Alita, for bringing this up. We appreciate that. 
So this is um, an update since kind of the beginning of the year. So um, we're going to touch on <coughs> uh, in terms of uh, Chrome update on Chromebooks and computer-based testing, uh, talk about firewall, web content filters, um, talk a little bit about bandwidth usage in comparison between last year and this year, and then um, tie it up and finish it up around building safety um, around the district. So first slide. Yeah, Oh, sorry. Thanks. So it's important. We I've mentioned several times um, in these meetings that this year, particularly, all all students for MCAS will be taking their tests um, online, and it will be a computer-based test. We have now this year we will move to the high school in grade ten, doing their ELA and their math um, MCAS um, online. Grades three, four, five, six, seven, and eight also will be doing that in ELA and math. They've been doing that. And grades five and eight will now be taking their science, technology, and engineering tests um, online in a computer-based fashion. The high school had a pilot test last year that was just a pilot to get kids used to taking it on uh, online. Um, that didn't count for anything, but that was to give them some um, experience doing so. Um, so in terms of um, the assessment system for this year, all students will be, will be taking those tests online. Um, in our K through five schools, um, just in terms of taking a look at um, technology, we have 185 Chromebooks per school in our K through fives. Um, and with that, we've got six Chromebooks per classroom in grades three, four, and five. Um, I think there's an effort, and she can speak to this, but really to get kids, particularly in grade three, four, and five, even mm -hmm. though they're not one to one, to be giving them those skills because they're going to be taking their comprehensive assessment tests online come the spring. And then I've spoke um, a lot already since the beginning of the year in terms of grade six through twelve. All students grade six through twelve are now in a one to one fashion. The end of the trimester. Um, will be coming for our sixth graders. Um, they have yet to take them home, but they, they will be doing that um, at the end of the first trimester. We've got 25 spare units in each middle school, which represents about 10% of that student population. And we've got 60 spare units, uh, Chromebooks, um, located in the high school. And those are for, you know, if a kid needs a loaner, sometimes an instructional assistant needs a, needs a Chromebook, et cetera. Um, so we've got those um, that are deployed in each of our schools. And the, the Chromebook rollout, um, I think this fall was highly successful. Um, you know, very few kinks. Uh, all students have them. We've got systems in place at each of our schools for when kids have problems. Um, there's an adult that they can take it to. Um, it can be assessed and they can get a loaner if, uh, if their Chromebook is broken or um, needs some additional work. Next slide talks specifically about um, our firewall and our web content filter. We held a parent information night, Chromebook night, last month, which was well attended by over 50 parents um, in the district. I'll say that a lot of the questions and concerns that did come up um, at that information session certainly had to do with <coughs> content filtering and firewalls, etc. Um, we want to we want to note that we are CIPA compliant, and that's the Child Internet Protection Act. With the firewalls that we do have, a huge priority, um, particularly this fall and this year, has been online safety, um, the monitoring and management of that. We've had a lot of discussions as an administrative team um, in terms of what that means. Um, that first bullet on there is social media and social media access. Um, online bullying as well as self-harm. Um, she and his team have done an awesome job monitoring that. I can tell you he is in my office regularly with reports and what our content filters and what our firewalls can do. Um, it tracks what kids are searching on Google. Um, it also tracks that if kids are using it inappropriately, inappropriate language, if they're looking up things that might relate to self-harm or drugs, conversations that they might be having within the Google Suite, and we take a look at those together. And then I take a look at them and I call the building principals, and those kids are brought in personally and have it, and there is a discussion had, and there are times when parents are called. So kudos to your department for the way in which you are monitoring that, because I don't know that anything is getting, <laughs> is getting by 
um, either the filter or you folks. Um, and uh, there is a personal conversation having with the, being had with a student and uh, a building administrator, and sometimes a parent, as well as sometimes a guidance counselor, depending upon the severity of um, the, the online management and monitoring of that. Um, we really have not given much social media access at all. There are issues around social media that um, are certainly around bullying. Um, kids can get on their phones, and kids can, at home can access social media, but we've kind of had an uh, administrative stance here that it's not necessary or needed at school. Um, if there is a teacher, et cetera, who might need access to something that might be tied to <coughs> photography or digital photography, we can certainly work with that teacher and have. Um, but in terms of social media access, um, we're really putting a hard line on that. <coughs> of what we have seen um, and what it can do to, to kids. In terms of cybersecurity, um, we're, we're first looking at number one, prevention, and number two, uh, privacy. Um, in terms of looking at viruses, malware, and phishing, um, Superintendent Clinchy and I were at a um, workshop at the MASC MASS conference where we learned a lot, um, and we've been talking a lot about that with Chi um, and his team. Um, the content filter, as just as a reminder, on Chromebooks does follow kids home. So when they take their Chromebook home, it's the same content filter that they have here. Um, and that does carry with them wherever they go. Um, the other thing is that you know, not having access to social media, et cetera, really does help promote student focus in the classroom or student focus even when they're in a study hall or they're in the cafeteria. Uh, they don't have access to the social media sites when they're on the NRSD um, site. The next slide, just to um, compare, uh, and she might be able to speak this a little bit better than I can because he's more technical than I am, but the um, top visual is 2017 from the end of August, which would be the start of school, to uh, mid-November. The bottom visual is the same thing, but for this year, and we really just want to point out, this really is Chromebook deployment one-to-one -one deployment so you can see the usage in, in terms of when we've given out Chromebooks, uh, but we haven't gone up in terms of our bandwidth, in terms of using more. You can see, see that it's robust this way because every kid has a Chromebook, but in terms of what we're using, that has not gone up. And you might be able to speak a little bit more specifically than I yeah. can. Just a quick note, if you compare the picture, especially what Todd just pulled out, uh, on the top one, the total usage almost the same, which is a good thing, meaning like we don't need to buy additional bandwidth. But if you look at the picture, the, the picture, the, the density on the bottom one is much more than yeah. the top one. Mm -hmm. Meaning like because the students have one to one, so students can use their device anytime they want, anywhere, anywhere. So it has much, much more usage compared to before. So that is the piece we would like to show you guys. Uh, Mike. So to the valleys in both the top graph and the bottom graph, do those represent weekends? Oh uh, yes, that's actually, every single one is, is, is a week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you can see like since around like uh, end of September, that's when like we fully deploy all this one to one, you can see the usage, it's non-stop. Okay. But before like you can see those kind of dips. So that is very positive thing. Um, <laughs> what's the... <laughs> There's like black lines on the bottom of both, and then the blue. Oh, that's uh, What's the black. The black line is kind of the average usage. The blue line is kind of the, the maximum. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's, that's. <laughs> All right. Uh, Steve. Do we do we uh, when when we when we are using these things that uh, limit what they can do. Fil filters. 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 Yes. Do we have? Does, does that also apply if they're using cell phones in the school? No, no and they'd be on their own, their own, network. their own network, their, their own, own LTE network. or four G or three G yeah. or whatever that they're on because they're not accessing um, our NRSD. But um, there's a two different way of accessing Wi-Fi content. When they use their cell phone, if they choose your their cell phone data, we cannot control. But if they decide to use our internet, our like Wi-Fi, we do manage it. Then it's bad. Okay. Yes. Oh, so we do have some control when they're using it. Yes. All the time. Susan, I just had. Well, I have to 
will be a quick question about the grades three through five Chromebooks. The six per classroom, is that, um, was the decision made to, to give each class, but is there a concern that some of them will be underutilized and then there'll be other classrooms that, that would maybe, if they were given more, um, want to use more? Like why not carts rather than? That's actually a good question. So I think the rationale behind that is, First, uh, the, the exam level, the, the usage uh, is not as much as the middle school, right. but they do have a car set up. For example, if a, a teacher wants to get more uh, students involved, they will borrow, car, borrow the device from other, other classroom oh, from okay. their neighbors. Okay. Yeah, they have some kind they of have access to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. yeah, I know everyone shares. So yeah. <laughs> and I know that it's important to be fair, but I wondered why it wasn't a park system. Okay. Pretty okay, and then the last piece um, is just around building safety and security. And I know Chi and his team have already laid the groundwork um, for a lot of this in terms of moving for forward. But security, uh, security cameras um, in terms of a server upgrade, switches um, in the cameras themselves, as well as door ac door access. They're working on server upgrade, um, control panel upgrade for that, as well as our public address systems and speakers are all kind of on the. Radar. The radar in terms of moving forward with technology and security at our buildings and safety at our buildings. So, questions. Here's your update. Quick snap. Well, so the, the stuff moving forward is that on the um, capital plan? Pat's saying yes, it is. Yeah. So is that what you're talking with the town managers about, or is that something different? Without well, well, presenting to their um, to their fincoms. Uh, so we'll we put out some so, so we'll get more detail on that later. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Other questions, Mike? Uh, I don't know if this is a question for uh, Todd or for Chi, but since since we're, we've sort of made this shift to storing everything in G Suite, whether it's on a drive or I mean, it, it's for a teacher, it's probably almost everything at this point. Do we do we give up any of our administrative controls for? protection um, and prevention administrative controls. It, do we rely on Google for that kind of protection or do we have, do we still retain we have, the ability to sort of enforce that? We have total control. Yeah. So it's not as if by storing everything through Google we have to go through Google? No, okay. everything is encrypted first of all. So like, you know, and uh, all the domain, all the content, you know, solely belong to us and Google do not have access to that. And and also, on top of that, we have backup of all the, all, all the data. We can move yeah. anytime we want. Yeah. It's also a big part of, part of the reason why, you know, in terms of us taking a stance on social media, because privacy is a tremendously huge issue, in, particularly in public education and particularly around student information. They're under the age of 18. And so when we, and I brought this up before, but when we take a look at software, instructional software, you know, we're making sure that those companies are complying with security agreements that they don't sell that information about students, their web address, et cetera, to third parties. Mm -hmm. And so that's why social media, we know, has done that, you know? Um, so which is why, why we don't, we need to make sure that instructional software, um, those companies will adhere to our privacy agreements and not then sell that information, particularly about anybody in our <coughs> third parties. <coughs> Other questions for Todd or Chief? Lynn. Um, the security door access and public address systems, I mean, those can get pretty costly. So I'm just wondering, because I know you want to upgrade them all, are they part of the five year plan? I don't think that we have a, a five year plan necessarily. Because to be honest with you, like some, well, and, and we're each of them is being addressed kind of differently. So I don't, I don't want to make a blanket statement on on those there are different PA systems needs because there are different needs in every school. Like Lancaster, for example, has an immediate need that we're dealing with right right now. So they're all at different stages, to be honest with you. So I don't think it's like a, an evergreening, like every five year type thing. I, it's not really that. It's really is a, a need over the course of several years. But they're included in the tech plan and the five-year plan, right? Well, they're actually included uh, on the capital plan. Not necessarily. Plan. I mean, if, if it's just a repair that needs to be done, it would be part of, you if know, scheduled small. maintenance. Okay. 
Um, it, it depends on the size of, of the, um, the project. The need. Lancaster's need is bigger. So it just yeah. really depends. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. All right. Next item is Brooks. Yeah, and this should be it's quick, the actually. Central office. Yeah, the organizational chart, new and improved. New and improved. <laughs> <laughs> it's where we stand today, and I think I just want to put out there quickly that this this is an ever-evolving um, piece, <clears throat> a, an ever-evolving document. But right now, I think what one of the things that um, we've done, again, this came from a couple years ago, is every year can you bring us an org chart so we can take a look and see so that we're constantly current. So we, we revise it with some regularity. Of course, the change this year is the assistant superintendent, and basically what you see is exactly what we said all the way along would be under his bucket of duties as such, um, which is the teaching and learning and technology. So you'll see that uh, that's really his area, his, his domain, and then the others uh, continue to be under, under my uh, primary purview. And then Alita's kind of right in here and you can see that she's for, for basically for both of us so so, um, so these really are the directors along the way and then their immediate staff underneath and that's basically exactly how things are run right now there's not a lot of changes other than adding Todd's component quite frankly everything else is pretty much exactly the same. It was just a case of Alita taking the teaching and learning piece and the technology pieces and moving it <coughs> under Todd. That's it, any unless questions? you have any questions. Okay. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, subcommittee reports. Um, uh, Steve, do you have anything else to report from budget and warrant? Um, nothing more except that um, starting with our December 5th meeting, mm -hmm. which we will have a meeting at 5 o'clock, we will start looking at pieces of the budget right. that will have already been submitted to us. It will be complete, but it will be certain pieces that we'll start looking at so we can move it along, move the process along. We feel that this year's process will be a lot better than <coughs> this year's This year gets a little bit better. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything to report um, from uh, CPAC. Um, I don't think there's any correspondence to note. No. Um, the consent agenda, I think we're cool with that. Yeah. We need to remember to sign the warrants before we leave. Okay, so we will be entering into executive um, session. So I would like to make a motion to adjourn the regular school committee meeting and enter into executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Law C30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, superintendent of schools, and pursuant to MGL uh, C30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions to co or contract negotiations with non-union personnel at Unit C grievance and this to include the District Council, Mike Macaro. And it will also at a point include um, representatives from Unit C, um, the MT MTA, this is just, I just found out, okay. uh, MTA rep. What you say? NREA uh, president, and then the first one, this is for the, the writing the motion, will include uh, the superintendent for clenching. Oh, and then the second part will also include um, Todd McGuire and Brooke. Yeah. Any and the committee will adjourn in executive session. Yes. So, we need to do a roll call. Oh, you got everything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Susan. Mm -hmm. Oh, second, second the motion. Second. Susan second. Yes. Okay, second. roll call. Susan? Yes. Steve? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Lynn? Yep. Steve? Uh, Mike? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, we're good? We're okay. Yeah. Go into the session.